Hi guys, Melissa here. This is the audio from the discussion I had on the YouTube channel Cryptube with my friend Jonathan. Thought we'd put the audio up here as well. If you want to watch it on YouTube, I'll put a link in the description for that as well. But yeah, that's uh, that's what this is. So I hope you enjoy it. I talk about a bunch of things like a little bit about the job I do in real life. A lot about Tales from the Crypt. We talk about horror movies. We talk about Gus, who's right here, the podcast. Hi, Gus. Come here. Ooh. Gotta pick him up. He's so heavy. But you get to see him and you can hear him purring right now, probably. Can you say enjoy the episode? Oh, you give me kisses. All right. So guys, enjoy the episode. Here it is. And again, if you want to check it out on YouTube, there's a link. And go to Cryptube and check out all the other great stuff that Jonathan has up there. There's a couple other discussions and interesting like archive videos and things like that, as well as 4K restorations of Tales from the Crypt episodes. So yeah, check that out. Bye! Hey there, boils and ghouls, and welcome to our blood-curdling second helping of live stream discussions. I'm your master of the bone chilling macabre, Jonathan, and with me today is a very special guest. Uh, um, I mean guest. Uh, she is the host of the infamous, infamously uh, dedicated podcast that covers our dead time stories and its films, the Good Evening Giddy Kitties podcast, which is on almost every podcast platform that you can think of. So if you're not following her, what in the hell are you doing? May I introduce to you all the ghosts with the mostest. Melissa Jerkowski. Melissa, how are you doing today? Welcome for being uh, to the uh, podcast. <laughs> Good. Thank you for having me on. Uh, are you wearing a Tales from the Crypt shirt today? Because I am. Oh, I mean, come on. There's no other way to do it. <laughs> I mean, come on. This is how you got to do these things. All right, cool. I was hoping I was like, I wonder what kind of, which one he's going to wear. Because I know you got probably a couple. I know I got like three or four. I also really like your background there behind you. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, so. <laughs> nice little mixture of Chucky and the Crypt Keeper. I mean, they're they're long lost cousins. I mean, we all know why. That's true. Yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, pretty sure they see eye to eye. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, I was no, trying no, to but... think of some iPod. I was like something with eyes. Uh, oh man, ice yeah. cream. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, at some point uh, in the future, I plan on uh, making this little homage uh, a little bit bigger, plus a little bit more organized. Right now, uh, as you can see, all the frames are uh, discombobulated. They're not exactly uh, lined up properly, but I plan on t t taking care of that. But enough about me. Um, how are you doing lately? You know, uh, I, I know you, uh, there's a lot going on in the world and in the country. Uh, like, how are you doing personally? Uh, personally, I'm doing all right. I mean, it kind of comes and goes, you know, uh, some days are better than others. I mean, I, for the most part, I have a lot to be grateful for. And then I have this uh, podcast on the side that I work on besides my regular nine to five or whatever. And uh, yeah, so I mean, for the most part, I'm doing pretty good. That's good. 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 And uh, how you do, how you holding up against COVID? You know, or, or first and foremost, I want to make sure like, you know, you family and friends, you know, you guys are all staying uh, healthy and safe, you know, with uh, the pandemic and I hope you guys are doing good in all this. Yeah, I mean, we're doing the best we can. Uh, I live with my boyfriend, Mike. He's on the podcast a couple times, uh, like yes, 10 yeah. or more times. And uh, it's us and Gus, the podcast. And yeah, we just kind of, you know, try to be as safe as we can, you know, doing what we got to do and, um, you know, keeping in touch with our family. We have family who live nearby, so it's not like it's too far away. Um, my brother lives in New York, though, so it's kind of like, you know, seeing how that goes, New York kind of bounces in and out with how they're doing on the numbers and stuff like that. So, but yeah. 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 Trust me. I know I'm from New Jersey, so I know exactly uh, yeah. what it's like. It's, it's really highly populated, overpopulated is a more appropriate term to use there. But yeah, like I, I know with all the politics going on and, you know, mass up, mass down, you know, mandates, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, make sure everyone's staying healthy and everyone's still, you know, avoiding COVID as much as possible. So with the new variants coming out. Mm -hmm. But uh, aside from that, you know, I'm glad to hear you're doing good. And I'm, you know, let, let's let's lean into why we are here. We are here to discuss you. We are here to discuss your podcast, Good Evening Kitties, which, you know, like, I, I, I just got to be upfront right now. I am a huge fan of what you've been doing with this podcast. You know, no, thank was, you. Like when I first got introduced uh, to your podcast, you know, I had to play a lot of uh, backtracking. So I had to go to like you know your first few episodes and listen to some of those and you know uh, up to the and I don't know if uh, everyone out there is uh, aware but you know Melissa uh, humbled me by having her on the podcast for one episode to discuss Demon Knight so 
Uh, yes, it was, it was awesome. Yes, yes, it was. We had a good awesome. time. I was very, very excited to be a part of it, and thank you for having me on that episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was. I had a great time on that episode. Um, but um, before we get into the podcast, uh, I want to get I want to get the fans to know a little bit more about you personally. You know, I'm I'm not sure if you're closely guarded uh, about you know your personal life, but you know maybe you can help uh, me uh, provide them a little insight as, as to who you are. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. All right, awesome. Now, I understand that you have a bachelor's degree in, in uh, biology and environmental design studies. Uh, I'm sorry, environmental design, excuse me. <laughs> organism studies, environmental yes. organism studies, and uh, have been uh, able to study the uh, genetic modification of plants to improve uh, human, animal, and uh, plant nutrition. Uh, could you give a little bit uh, of insight to the audience uh, in regards to the research and the benefits that it could provide the world? Uh, yeah, I mean, what I work with currently, I work in plant science. I started out more animal, but as things changed and, you know, like I developed allergies and things that kind of prevented me from doing certain things, I ended up going more into plant science. And so I've been with the company I've been with for eight years now, and I'm a lab tech. And we mostly, in the lab I'm in, mostly deal with uh, like drought resistance and C4 grasses and things like that. So working with how to use less water to grow crops in certain areas that may, you know, be affected by climate change and things like that. So that's kind of what we work on. And then I um, test different types of crops, uh, like like corn and soybeans and stuff, for different elemental compositions in order to kind of figure out, you know, where we can go from there for different labs and things like that. So yeah, that's extremely impressive. Um, could you could. Okay, so for me, I, like, like I, I, I'm lame in, in this subject because I, I was terrible at high school biology. Um, could you like kind of like third grade that down a little bit? Because like, you know, so because uh, you mentioned because you mentioned the idea of um, being able to help plant life grow without with with less water. How does that work? Well, there's certain types of plants that kind of there's certain grasses and things that can you kind of play to their strengths. Like you study them and break them down. And I have. We have different things, and like work with different other labs and stuff um, that can kind of view the plants and what they're made of and like take that and then whatever plant is strongest. It's kind of like with, um, I guess it's similar to kind of like if you if you breed a dog a certain way right. because you want it to have a certain trait. Like you get a cat or a dog that comes out that's got little, you know, extra toes. And you want to bring that on. So you'd be like, well, I'm going to play to that and keep using that thing. So you like, you find these grasses and other plants like cassava and stuff that can be grown in different types of situations based on where they come from or, you know, whatever. And then be like, well, how can I use that to kind of keep it going and like spread the word and let other, you know, the, the place I work, it's like just a bunch of different labs that do all kinds of different things. So um, everyone just does a little bit of everything. Okay. Okay. So th- that, that makes a little bit more sense to me. Um, uh, I don't, I don't know if you know, but like, I kind of look more into nutrition for, uh, what we intake nowadays. Cause I, I like to, I'm like kind of like an amateur bodybuilder. So, um, yes, I like to look at the pictures of your food sometimes <laughs> if you put, when you're like in the service or whatever, and you'll post, it's a lot of food, man. Yeah. I mean, trust me in order for the body to grow properly and healthy, you got to eat the right way. And, uh, you know, I, I've been trying to make sure I've, I've been doing that, uh, to the best of my ability. Um, so I'm glad you're enjoying the pictures, um, uh, in that aspect. Um, but, um, I know for a fact that when it comes to, uh, daily intake and nutrition, uh, when it comes to what we eat, um, one of the biggest things is eating green. And, you know, uh, I know for a fact that when, uh, those who diet with, uh, who have a high diet of beef or, or meat, poultry, anything of the sort, um, a lot of our, uh, agriculture plays a big part in that. And it goes into, um, the animals that we do eat. So like, you know, cows, chickens, like, like they eat our, they, they eat agriculture and, you know, that fuels them and feeds them. That way we get stronger and more healthy, um, meats. Um, that being said, based on the research that you're doing, um, would that cause somewhat of a discrepancy with that kind of, um, nutrition? I'm not too sure with that one. I mostly, I think we mostly deal with like human nutrition not necessarily by giving it to other animals, but just like um, impoverished countries and things like that. Especially, I think with our cassava project, it's to help teach other countries and things how to grow that in their area because the cassava has 
more nutrients or more carbohydrates than any, you know, other like rice or something they may be eating. So it's more of that kind of stuff and straight into meat production. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, I mean that that, that just answers all the questions that I, I was was gonna answer uh, ask. You. <laughs> But um, all right, all right. No, that that makes it so much more simpler. Um, that is great research, and I, I can't wait to see uh, the fruits of you know your labor. Like hopefully it allows us to learn to be able to eat healthier, and you know causes plant life to grow in a much uh, healthier rate, uh, especially with climate change because climate change is a big thing nowadays. Yes. You know? So uh, good luck to you and your and uh, your uh, research for that. Thank you. Uh, so. And I'm going to go into a very, very terrible segue into now the podcast. <laughs> um, paint us a picture. Uh, what was your experience like when you first stepped into the catacombs of the crypt? Uh, how did you feel about the show or even the Master of Ceremonies when you first uh, saw the franchise? I was a pretty scared child uh, of a lot of things, <laughs> spooky wise. And yeah, so I know what like. uh, when I first noticed the show, you know, on. HBO or wherever I would see it for like syndication. Um, I was pretty terrified of the Crypt Keeper. I didn't mind the stories themselves. I don't really remember a lot offhand when I was younger, but I do remember being afraid of the beginning and the end of the episode because I knew the Crypt Keeper would come back and I didn't want to see it. So, um, you know, you try to like either cut it off at the end or, you know, whatever. Um, (laughs) So, yeah. So it wasn't until... Like, I was more of, like, an early teenager and later when I started getting into horror movies and things like that. And then that's when I started, you know, watching the show more and getting into it better that way. It wasn't until, like, late teens. Uh, I, I can't. I The story you just told me is, like, very, very closely relatable to mine <laughs> because I, I, I was terrified. I think, I'm sorry? I think a lot of people were afraid of the Crypt Keeper. I think that would catch yeah. a lot of kids off of it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Crypt Keeper, I mean, like, some people can easily embrace certain horror characters, and it's almost like it's natural to them. And um, what I've noticed, at least in my experience, uh, I was tormented with the Crypt Keeper. The moment I first saw the Crypt Keeper, it was terrifying. And then I had my brothers and sisters, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, continuously jab me and poke me with that fear. So uh, Were they older? Yes, they were. Okay, see, I'm the oldest out of me and my brother, so if anything, it would need me to the opposite, but since I didn't want anything to do with it, it's like I didn't have <laughs> yeah. it coming from all ends like you did. I'm oh, sure they yeah. love scaring me with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, they would hum the tails theme, you know, they would do the cackle. Uh, one time, my brother, you know, promised me, like, he came up to my bedroom and he said, hey, John, I have a, I have a great surprise for you. You know, come downstairs. We, we have it waiting for you. Covered my eyes, brought me downstairs, and then the moment the Crypt Keeper pops up on the TV, you know, he opens my eyes, he goes, surprise, and there's a Crypt Keeper on the screen cackling, you know, wildly, and, you know, that just helped me, help provide nightmares for about 15 years after that, Uh, (laughs) because I didn't get over my fear of the Crypt Keeper up until high school, where I slowly uh, started, you know, exposing myself to, like, Google image searches and, you know, old videos, but just, yeah, it wasn't until I became a teenager where I actually started to, uh, take my fear and make it into an obsession. So yeah, I, I completely relate on that. And that's, that's a great story that you have. Mm-hmm. Um, now in regards to that fear and turning it into an obsession, right? Uh, you were able to take that fear and translate it into your podcast. Good evening, kitties. Uh, can you tell me what you hope to contribute to the platform uh, for tales? Mainly, I think I wanted to just remind people out there that it's it was around. Uh, it's starting to get where it's, what, like 30, 35 years that it's, it, it's been off. Um, and just to kind of remind people that it was there. And, like, also just, you know, because other act, all kinds of different things, actors have been in it, all kinds of different directors have been on it. And, you know, some people just, with this new wave of, of kids and teenagers and stuff, just not really listening or like knowing about it and then for people who have to kind of bring back those recaps of even the episodes that the ones are familiar with and the ones that's ones that they're not which is one reason i like to add audio clips into my episodes because even if you've never seen it it can kind of set you know it's more of a chronological way through the episode that you can be like oh you know, even if i've never watched this i kind of get where it's going and what's happening and you know things like that um so yeah just kind of 
remind people of it. And uh, yeah, and the more and more that I watched it as I got older, as a teenager in early 20s, I, I really liked it. And I was looking for something to do. And I started thinking of the podcast and I was like, well, I love horror. I love all that stuff, horror movies and things like that. And that's why eventually I started putting those on the podcast as well, just because I was like, well, I, I'm always watching horror a lot so I might as well put little reviews on there of movies I haven't seen before so I started inter, you know, putting that in there as well but because of that I was like well I should pick some sort of spooky show that I know I really like to really get into it and while I don't super deep dive like um, like I enjoy that you get more into like the distribution rights and the things like that because I don't always really get into that as much uh, nor do I really get into the comics uh, I mean I know about some of them and I'll mention them if certain movies and stuff like because i reviewed the old tales from the crypt movie and the vault of horror from the 70s um and i'll mention those things but um mine's more of just the series recap kind of thing but yeah it's, it's interesting to connect with other people who have done different types of dives from each side you know of it and then you know then with them bringing up possibly bringing the show back and things like that and this, all this kind of stuff so yeah so that's kind of what i got into it and, you know, trust me, like, when it comes down to creating a platform, uh, the one thing that I notice is, like, the most difficult part is for getting yourself out there, you know, putting yourself out there to people, because mm -hmm. you wonder, you know, are they going to think the same way as I do, or, you know, is it going to be confliction, you know, are they going to receive me well, and that's one of the things that I think is, like, the hardest part about starting uh, a podcast, and, you know, I, I give you all the credit in the world for doing what you do, and, like, you're going strong, uh, from what I... And I don't know if you guys are, have, have noticed or if you follow her podcast yet, but this this woman is everywhere on every podcast platform <laughs> that you can think of. I did some uh, small research and she is on Anchor FM. She's on Spotify. She's on iTunes. Uh, she out, She's also on Podbean, which is where I first found her. Uh, mm -hmm. Like this, this woman is everywhere and she she's getting a, a, a following. It's almost like a snowball effect. And I congratulate you on that because Thank you you. Know, I remember how you yeah. first started off and you're trying to get big and. It's, it's, it's going very well for you. Yeah, it's, I'm trying to, to build up on it. I mean, I am coming up towards some of the end of the show, but, like, um, you know, different things have set me back. Like, I've noticed in the first year I put, like, three seasons out almost of episodes, and then it's kind yeah. of draped it off since then. But, um, you know, that life just gets in the way and stuff. But, yeah, I kind of just try to keep stuff coming out, usually two episodes a month. And then, um, uh, you know, try to, I get on Twitter a lot or Facebook and like interact. And then you got the group of gore that I, I joined shortly after I started everything. And which we're yeah, glad to have you, by the way. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone's been really supportive and there's a lot of people out there still talking about Tales from the Crypt and interested in talking about, like people love talking about different, their favorite episodes. That's one I, I usually, anytime I bring that up, everyone's like, oh yeah, that one was just going to be so bad or, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's exciting to see that. And then you know, John Kassir follows me too. He's supportive, which I think is great, you know, and he seems to be pretty involved in the community, you know, still doing all that. So, um, and even like the other, like AL Cats and, um, I never pronounce his name right. Uh, is it Jaeger? Yes. Jager. Kevin Jaeger. Jaeger. Kevin Jaeger. Yeah. He, he's in there too. And then, um, yeah. So, you know, it's just interesting to meet all these different people and things like that. Especially the ones that are uh, deeply involved in the uh, process and production of the show. You yes. Know, uh, sometimes, you know, you wouldn't even, like, when we do our research about this show or just the episodes in general, the overall franchise, like, we have such an understanding of it because of our love for it. But it, it's it, it's like unveiling something completely new when you have a very special guest involved in the production. And it's like you didn't even know uh, some of the uh, interesting trivia that they provide you. And it's just like, what did... It makes you feel like you didn't even know anything from the start <laughs> when it comes to some of the things that they tell you. And like, you know, when, the, uh, for example, the the Tales game that I put out, uh, mm -hmm. like that, that was an amazing, amazing uh, piece of information that uh, I was able to acquire and learn and provide to the fans. Um, and um, when it comes down to your podcast, like it, I can only imagine with some of the trivia that's given to you when it comes to talk, talking to some of these special guests that uh, the feeling that comes with it. And then you got to learn how to like speak on the fly about some of those things. I can only imagine how that would go. Well, I mean, I don't have too many certain special guests from like on the podcast as much. It's more like 
friends or like other podcasters and things like that. But I do like to keep in touch with that kind of stuff. And then there's some other podcasts out there who are doing that. And cause I'm a little shy. So oh, right. I, I don't always like reach out and, and talk to some, I, I don't really like bother people though. I will admit, um, not even just with podcasts, but just like reaching out to certain people ever since all this COVID stuff, like people are at home more. So a lot of people who have been from these shows are more apt to say something back. Like if I, um, like I put up an episode or a review a long time ago about uh, the reluctant vampire. Right. And the, the woman, Sally, off of that commented on that on my Twitter. That, Cause I was really? like, Oh, I love Sally so much. I love her. And then she was, she found it and was like, Oh, thank you so much. You know, and stuff like that. So I was like, that's Oh, awesome. that's fun. You know, cause yeah, it's just all these actors who have, um, you know, people don't always bring it up for that kind of stuff they used to do. And it was just like this little flip in their career and that, you know, for someone to bring it up. And yeah. So I always like to bring that up, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of like different actors and stuff. That's what, that's what I really like about the show is that each one is a different, it's like just different directors and different actors and, the little twists and things like that. I mean, there's a lot of tropes too that I've noticed as I've been reviewing the show, but, um, and they're not like all bad or anything, but I mean, there's definitely, you know, like five or six different types of episodes. So. Yes. Yes. I've noticed. And like, uh, it, it goes from your episode reviews. It goes from film reviews, uh, also to other horror content reviews. Um, is that going to be like a, a thing once the franchise is done? So like, uh, Basically, um, this is, this is going to be the segue into the next question. So, as of right now, you are on season six, episode thirteen. You are like you're already almost done with the franchise. Period. You already yes. did Bordello of Blood. You already did uh, Demon Knight. Now you're on Ritual. Yes. You know, which I I'm know done with all the movies. <laughs> yes, yeah. and you know, um, I already know a lot of fans. Uh, they're gonna like, ugh, Ritual. You know, <laughs> but, you know, you even went out of your way to like, yeah, you know, we're gonna do Ritual. That's oh, Still, I don't care. It's still a Tales from the Crypt film, and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but, uh, which, by the way, also, those two, uh, last two episodes we discussed are, are still on Podbean, they're on iTunes, you know, uh, Anchor FM. Make sure you go check those out. Um, but you are on the home stretch right now with the franchise. How does it feel? And uh, what do you intend on doing once the reviews are done with the franchise? It feels good that I'm at the end of season six. I think it took me longer than I thought it was going to take, but uh, it's been it's been a fun ride. One thing I am interested in is with season season seven. I really don't remember a lot of those episodes, so to go back into them, it's going to be kind of fun to be like, oh okay, you know, just remind myself of all these ones. Um, and I love a lot of like British TV and things, so I'm sure a lot of the actors I'll be like, oh, they're from so and so, you know, all this stuff. And I also plan to have, you know, some cups of tea while I review it. I want to try like a, gonna, a, 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 I want to try like a milky it, uh, English tea on some of the episodes. <laughs> like I want to try a couple different things depending yeah, on what the episode's getting, about. You're getting regal Brit fancy on that one, huh? Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so so I'll do that, and then um, yeah, so then I'll wrap it up, and then I think I might just take a break for a bit, um, well and maybe a. Yeah, and maybe eventually either join up on a podcast with someone else or maybe just do really small horror movie reviews or something. I thought about eventually, like when I first started the podcast, I started I thought about like when I was done that I would do like Tales from the Dark Side or something. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm not really sure now. I think what I need is a break from editing. That's what I need. <laughs> yeah. Because after this is done, I'm like, you know what? I just, I don't want to edit any more stuff. Um it's not so bad. It's just I'm a bit particular about my ums and my sniffs. And <laughs> many times I say, um, you know, I say that a lot, you know, and um and all that. So, and then I got to plug in the audio clips and things like that. So it takes a, a little bit of time and I have a hard time sitting still, I think. So, um, so some of the, you know, that's why most of the episodes I think are usually you know, between 20 and 40 minutes, depending on what's going on. Uh, Cause I just, I, I can't get through any more of that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's basically what I would be doing, but I would still be involved in like, you know, the, the different tales of the crypt sections. And I would keep my Twitter going and things like that. Like, and I'm, I'm going to keep the podcast up 
you know, and stuff like that for a while. And maybe every once in a while I'll throw something out there. But I'm also considering, too, at the end, when I finish season seven, I may even do a few episodes where it's just like, these were some of my favorite episodes. These, This is an episode all about my least favorite episodes. And, you know, here's ones I would recommend. You know, just a couple different things at the end. Oh, so but, you got a Watch uh, Mojo thing going on, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. All yeah. right. Yeah, just because as I've been going through, there's a couple in my head where I'll, I'll finish the episode review and I'll be like, yeah, that's definitely on my, one of my least favorites. <laughs> oh, I, remember, fun. I remember one of the least favorites we discussed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we there's talked about it in the Demon Knight episode, where he's a crap, because we have completely separate, you really like it, and I really don't. Hey, and, all uh, respect. I mean, and trust me, like, after that discussion, I, I completely understood where your, your viewpoint yeah. was in that one. And I get what you're saying, too. I mean, it's a great twist and everything. It's just, yeah, it's just, for me, it's just, I don't know. And then, like, even, like, I would probably even throw Whirlpool on there is probably another one of my least. Um, it, it's not that it wasn't a fun episode. It just, there's just some that don't feel like they fit. Yeah. Um, but then there's some that you watch it, you're just like, oh, that's so Tales from the Crypt. Just the way it feels and everything. So, um, even Ritual, when I watched it, the, the latest, the last movie from 2002, it still felt like a Tales from the Crypt episode. It just wasn't great. <laughs> yeah. But it was right. just like, yeah. So. It's like a lot of the a lot, a lot of the episodes, maybe the films themselves, like they, they just, they're just missing the, that one critical ingredient that makes it a Tales from the Crypt episode. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember someone speaking to me uh, about um, Death Becomes Her. You know, uh, the fine little trivia behind that is it, it's made by most of the people that worked on the Tales uh, crew, uh, Robert Zemeckis specifically. And the trailer itself for that film plays the Tales from the Crypt theme, in, like from the midpoint. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, yeah. a lot of people don't realize that that was also a Tales-esque uh, type film, especially with the premise. I mean, if you watch Death Becomes Her, it could oh, be a Tales yeah. film. Uh, it could definitely be a Tales film, but... Uh, Again, uh, this person also felt like there's one critical ingredient that's missing from that to be a full-blown Tales film, uh, which I, I definitely agree with that person uh, when it came down to that. But uh, Do they know what that critical ingredient is? Uh, I they're saying it's more just like a feeling. Yeah, it's more like a feeling. Okay. They, they, they yeah, I mean, that's a great movie, and I can see that being yeah. you know, a similar type of situation. Yeah. And, you know, me personally, like, you know, like, uh, aside from the ones that we all know from Dusk Dawn and the Frighteners that were meant to be Tales films, uh, I, I honestly always felt like, especially with uh, how Robert Zemeckis had a huge hand in that, and especially with special effects and just with overall premise and story, like, that is definitely a Tales film. Yeah. You know, obviously, just, you know, it doesn't connect with what Bordello did or what Demon Knight did, especially with the key ingredient there from both of those films, the key. And, yes. You know, well, we, obviously, we didn't see that in Ritual because it got destroyed in Bordello, but I don't know. I always felt like those the, the rules in those films just didn't mesh well. In which which films? Uh, Demon Knight and Bordello. Ah. Especially with that key, because, uh, you know, for example, the Demon Knight uh, rule of what happens when blood is emptied from the key and the darkness is brought back. Uh, at one point in Bordello, when the priest is, uh, or when the reverend is holding the, the key in front of, uh, I forget his name, Vincent, when he, when he holds oh, it in yeah. front of Vincent, when he holds it in front of Vincent in his office, you can see it's com completely empty. <laughs> it's completely empty. I don't know if that was just an error on the, uh, on the, uh, director's part, or if it was basically uh, like a key little thing. Hey, did you notice it was empty? And then not only that, but the the key is destroyed in the film. Yeah. So wouldn't the darkness be brought back if that's the case? I mean, you can't take an element like that from the first film, bring it to the second film, ignoring those rules. Well, and also even in Demon Knight, where it's like, um, oh, what's Jada Pinkett, Pinkett's character? Uh, my God, now I'm going to go on blank. Uh, Geraldine. Yeah, Jerry, like she, um, at the end when she's going against the collector or whatever, and she takes the drink of the blood and it's in her mouth, it's technically empty in the key itself, too. But she has it, and I'm like, I don't know how she didn't swallow it the whole time she's fighting him and dancing with him <laughs> yeah. and all of this stuff. She's getting dropped downstairs and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> or even just being like gagging a little because she has this old blood. <laughs> <in her mouth. laughs> yeah, that. 
Like, that blood would have been in my gut by the time I started hitting those stairs. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, but, sorry, yeah. Earth. You know, you're you're destroyed. Okay. Um, off top, we went way off subject, but <laughs> <laughs> let's get back on track. Um, now we know that the the tales content and information is uh limited due to the fact that we don't have any more content, and the show has been dead s- and six feet under since 1996. <laughs> Uh, did the idea come to start the podcast um, on that and did, to give fans a different kind of insight into each episode or was there more to it? It was more just to give like a different, just like a recap, a different insight just to talk about how I felt about each episode and just, I don't know, I thought it'd be a fun, like I listened to a lot of podcasts and I thought it'd be a fun thing for, you know, you can just kind of put them in, they're half an hour or more long i kind of go through the whole episode chronologically there's audio clips you could cut it said i have because it's really not streaming anywhere which is what i really think it needs to be doing there are some lovely people including yourself who have put it up on youtube and i'm very grateful thank you but i do it for you guys yes (laughs) but they're not some of the other ones that have been put up are not always super clear looking or any or the sound might be weird i mean um but i really think it should be brought back to some sort of streaming whether that be hbo max or something else but yeah it definitely that's one thing i'm definitely for that so if i could get back to streaming again you know i mean i just went and bought them all on dvd but not everyone can do that or or is that into the show like some people just are like oh i remember those 10 episodes i watched all the time because sometimes they would play the same episode over and over you know on tv so um so when you tell someone there's like 93 episodes they're like what you know so uh to just kind of go through each of those. That's basically what I was wanted to do. Just give something for people to listen to when they're at work, you know, kind of thing. Uh, That's not too like, much to have to think through. <laughs> and then there's there's been plenty of times where I have to wake up at five in the morning, five thirty sometimes to do physical training because uh, I'm in the army. So like having to wake up at that that early crack of dawn hour. And sometimes I'll find myself driving to work listening to your episodes. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. thank you. No, no, thank you, because you wake me up. <laughs> so, like, you know, some people get a cup of coffee or, you know, a monster, especially in the Army. A lot of soldiers drink monsters and wake themselves up. Your podcast wakes me up. So I'm driving to work, podcast is up, and then, you know, I start my day. So thank you. <laughs> um, now, speaking of episodes of, of the podcast, uh, mm-hmm. on many occasions, uh, I believe you've corrected me on this, but you've had two instances where – your mother was a special guest on your uh, podcast. Um, does she enjoy the series as much as you do? Or did she develop like love for it when you would watch the episodes with her? And, you know, when are we going to expect her to come back? <laughs> uh, I was trying to get her on again soon, but she's, you know, things went a bit crazy, so she hasn't been able to. But, uh, no, my mom didn't like it then and probably doesn't like it now. She, <laughs> what it is is she loves me, <laughs> <laughs> I am her daughter, and she wanted to try it out. Um, I mean, she she's not a huge horror fan, and if she is, it's usually more realistic horror, like you know, not really like paranormal or creatures or anything like that. But she just doesn't find it. You know, she's not into like fantasy stuff. So, um, if anything, it was usually my dad or my brother, like us watching that kind of stuff. And so later, when I got older, and I was telling her about the podcast, and she wanted to be supportive, so she listened to some of it. And I saw that the episode, season two, episode 14, Lower Birth, was coming up, which is the roundabout way to get to the story of the birth of the Crypt Keeper. I thought, who better to have it on than my mom? So I asked her if she would do it. And I had her listen to a few episodes to kind of see the flow, you know. And, um, you know, I think she was like a little nervous because she's never done anything like that before. But um, she, she got into it. But I did tell her right before we did it and when we watched it, I was like, okay, just pretend like this could happen. Okay, like it doesn't have to be realistic. <laughs> pretend, pretend that a mummy and a two-faced man can have a baby. So she was like, okay. So she went into that. And then later when the episode Maniac at Large came on, I think it was season four, episode 10, uh, we both really liked Black Danner as an actress, so I was like, well, she might want to be on it. So I had her on, and that one was more realistic of just, like, a killer, you know? So, like, that one was a lot, I think, easier for her to get to. But, no, I don't think she's watched any others since then. But she has listened to some episodes. She'll, like, put them on. She likes to do um, puzzles, like, uh, 
you know, the ones with the little piece puzzle pieces. She'll do those and put it on on her phone. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And like, because uh, just in those two episodes, like you know, it seems like because you said that she doesn't really enjoy that kind of horror. But just the way she would speak about it, she seemed very, very interested and, and uh, in depth with the way she would review it with you. And it was something that I was like, I was wondering if she was one of the critical pieces of her putting you onto Tales. I don't know when I listened to those episodes. And, that you know, would probably be more friends and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was funny to hear you say like, no, 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 she hates. No. She, she really <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> That's awesome uh, that, that she was even... Uh, uh, interested in doing the episode with you and that, that's that's great you know that your mom wanted to be a part of that you know that realm with you uh so running a podcast nowadays is one of the hardest things to do especially since uh that's where everyone like they're they're making podcast channels now you know uh nevertheless you have been seeing a lot of traction and success in your venture into this realm uh what's your approach to make your podcast stand out above the others well, like I said, for one, the audio clips, I try to get, you know, a lot of the guests are my friends, um, so I try to get someone, or I'll invite someone new who's like a podcaster that I know like likes those kind of things or likes horror, or even like with my friends, I'll have an episode come up where I'm like, oh, that reminds me, like, like I have some friends on the podcast Discography Discussion, which is like a, a metal podcast. And when, it, when um, For Crying Out Loud came out, when I got to that one, I immediately was like, well, what about my friend Dan? Because I've known him, and he, me, we both used to do shows. And um, <clears throat> so I had him on so we could talk about music and stuff like that, because like I used to play music. like um, I, I wrote the music for the podcast. Like that, That's what I threw together with like you know a drum machine and synthesizer and stuff like that. And then... Um, even when I, my movie review podcast, that's an old song of mine. So like the, the intro and the middle part. So like, I just kind of threw those on there. So, um, so I do that. I got on Twitter after like a year or so, a year or two, and I've been doing that a lot, which Twitter has been pretty great. I get back on Facebook and do things with the groups and things like that. Um, I try to make it kind of fun, especially lately. I noticed past the leaders, I try not to overthink it. So, like, if I want to put something silly in it, I'll just do it. Um, so, for instance, in my, uh, I think, season five, episode three, Forever Amber Free, when I'm in that one, there's a scene at the end where uh, the woman is having sex with the guy knowing she's, like, infected and that they're both going to die together. Yeah. And when I was reading yeah. it, <laughs> when I was editing it, that song, uh, that, oh, me so horny song came to my head. And I was like, should I do it? And I was just like, you know what? Do it. So I put in yes. a clip of that in there. Like, I just, you know, like little things like that where I'm, you know, or I had one recently where it's something about um, Abe Lincoln. And so I threw in the clip from Robin Hood where they were like, hey, Lincoln or whatever. And Robin Hood made a tight So I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, just if it comes to my head when I'm editing, I'm like, yeah, why not go for it? Or like, if there's something I want to cut out, I find that I'm a little lenient to leave it in. I think some people like a little more banter or a little more, um, you know, I don't. Sometimes some of my reviews are, especially my movie reviews, are a little more stream of consciousness. Where at the end, I'm like out of breath. Where I'm like, sorry, that movie really got to me. You know, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but. Um, or how like it really like season six for Tales from the Crypt has been real like real sexy quote unquote. Uh-huh. So there's been a lot of episodes where I'm just like, okay, yeah, we're doing this, <laughs> we're doing this aggressive sex scene. But hey, it was HBO. That's I don't know what else to tell you guys. I mean, honestly, uh, I believe like all those gratuitous sex scenes were the reason why the uh, HBO was getting all those subscribers at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because some of them were thrown in definitely that had nothing to do. Story. Yeah, <laughs> like how do we yeah. open this? I don't know. Just... Hey, all right, uh, season five, shall we have some ratings after these sex scenes? Let, let, let's kind of up the uh, up the bar a little bit in season yeah. six, huh? Can we start with this episode with two people just going at it while they're just having a normal conversation? Exactly. <laughs> like, okay. Exactly. You call, call that uh, sexual tension? Yeah, it's called sexual tension. Okay, that's what brings ratings up. You know? Yeah, because that was uh, I think on a dead man's chest. It basically just opens up, and they're literally just conversing. <laughs> well, they're doing yeah. it like okay. Yeah. So, 
but yeah so that's like kind of like how I just stay into it and like I keep up with people like you or like other people there's some other podcasts and, and people that are getting involved and I know like like you brought up the stuff with the distribution rights so I've been kind of looking into that a little bit because the whole thing is like it was supposed to bring they were supposed to bring it back was it Shyamalan they were gonna have yeah do it TNT and, and then that. that fell through and I'm more of one of the rare people who I don't want it to come back but that's me a lot of people are like Woo, bring it back. um and the reason for that is today I know okay so movies and TV shows keep getting reboots right yes and it's never as good as it used to be. If anything, it's just a fan service where you're like, yep, I remember that. You know, like, I remember how that made me feel. So I'd rather just go back and watch the original thing. I also wasn't, not that I'd, I'd like Shyamalan fine. His movies can be a little hit or miss for me. But I want it, if it's going to come back, I'd want it to be similar to how it was where you have different directors for each thing. Like, they kind of did that a little with Creepshow. I don't know if you've seen the Creepshow series. Um, yeah. They brought back, yeah. So I watched the three seasons of that. And again, it, it was very hit or miss for me. There were some really good ones, but then there was also a lot of like, this one's a lot like Night of the Living Dead from George Romero. Oh, and this one's a lot like this, you know, and it was just like, like just bringing up stuff that you used to know that, like, I don't know. I just have a feeling that there's so many shows and things, and there's so many people making very unique shows and new shows that it's like I feel like they focus more on that I'm not saying we couldn't maybe do with another season or two of something but if they're gonna bring it back for Tales from they need to also stream the old stuff this uh, I completely 100 100% agree with you on every single thing that you said uh when it comes down to the uh the revival of the series uh I I wasn't fond of what I was reading about when it came down to the TNT series mm-hmm. and the reboot there uh I was I was way I was I was open-minded at the idea of what they were going to do, but I wanted to see what they were going to give us before I made my complete call on that in terms of judgment. But um, just based on, especially when when the idea came up about where uh, they were going to talk about bringing fans in into the whole concept, where they're going to, hey, hey, if you're a Tales fan, send us some of your stories as to what you would want to see in terms of a Tales episode. Sounds like a good way to cut costs. Yeah, exactly. So they weren't going to hire right. I mean, they, they maybe hire ghost writers in a way to kind of you know zhuzh it up a bit. Yeah, I mean, basically that whole uh, that whole crib keeper pun from um, uh, which which season uh, season three episode was it? Uh, For which man, which pun? Uh, morning morning mess. Morning oh, yeah. mess. You know the the crib keeper pun about ghost writing. You know was going to be playing full effect here. Uh, when it came down to this reboot, and you know, like nowadays, production companies are always sitting on nostalgia. You know, they 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 want fans to feel that that original feeling they had when they first used to watch these things as young adults or kids, and they want to make it relevant and more pertaining to the current generation in a way. So they wanted to get fifty percent demographic of nostalgia fans and fifty percent of the new generation. How do we get them together? Uh, based on what I know so far of what that series was going to do, I, I, I didn't have high hopes on it. I was going to that with low expectations. Uh, but yeah, um, if they, if they brought it back, and especially with like the original series was meant to have an eighth season, you know, a lot of people don't know that, but, um, if they were going to do it, you know, I, I strongly would suggest that they decided to bring it back in the HBO, um, way of doing things back in the original series and they decided to bring it back that way. They need to make it an eighth season. If they decide to go the other uh, route and make it an original, like homage to the original EC comics and do it a little bit more like the EC comics, then they would really need to make sure that they're paying attention to the EC fans on that one because the EC fans, they're, they're, they're they're, they're extremely, they're extremely devoted. uh, Yeah, because I belong to a group of that too. And some of those guys, those comic, like they know what they're talking about. Yes, they are, they, are, they are very strong experts in uh, what EC Comics did from the early get-go before Entertaining Comics uh, became Entertaining Comics, when it was Education Comics and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, so... And, and I, already, I already saw some of those forums, right, where EC Comics fans are just like... Some of uh, actually, more so a lot of them, don't really enjoy the 
HBO series. You know, especially with the Crypt Keeper portrayal. Like, but, you know, hey, to each their own. You know, uh, but needless to say, there is also a strong fan base for what the series did. And, you know, they, if they're going to do it, they got to do it right. Well, and also even with just graphics and stuff, like the, in the 90s show, the, you know, 89 through 96, there's a lot more practical effects. And I just worry what they would do in the future episodes because, like, say they were going to do Shamala, right? I don't know if you saw it. I watched that movie old, you know, that mm-hmm. he made. Yeah. And I'll usually, I like giving those movies a try. Some of them were really fun. I like the twists, you know, things like that. So, old was fine, okay? Whatever. But, it, when I first started the movie, I saw it was rated PG-13, and I was like, oh, no. Because I was hoping it was going to be like a body horror thing. So right. then the problem is, they do all these graphics or whatever, but then they don't show it. It's all, like, pulled away. And that's what I'd be kind of afraid they would do, because if it got on TNT or somewhere where, somewhere where they weren't allowed to show as much, you know, body horror or something like that, they would just pull away from the camera or cut it short. I mean, because even in the in the series on HBO, there are some really cool scenes that you really don't see anything, but it's enough. But then there are also some scenes that really stick with you, like Forever Amber Game, where he melts apart, you know, <laughs> in the tent, or, um, you know, just some of the, or even like the walking corpse until death. Like, that was a really good scene, you know, just stuff like that. So, I mean how would they cut corners with that and how would that look, you know, stuff like that. So I thought that's part of it. Cause yeah, some shows that I've watched where they bring it back. Sometimes I just don't even bother to watch them again, <laughs> but if they do, I'll be like, Oh, I'd rather just go watch the other stuff. But I mean, I'm not going to like poo poo all the reboots and stuff. Cause I mean, I know, I mean, some people still really like them. And I, I mean, I did go see Halloween kills or whatever. Um, in my opinion, it was terrible. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready for it to end. Um, Halloween, the Halloween one in 2018 was okay. Like it was fine. Right. And then Halloween Kills just. And so now that Halloween Ends is coming, I'm like, please, can it? Is that really going to be the end? Let's wrap. I don't need 70 year old Michael Myers trying to kill you know 70 year old Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, just and they're in retirement homes, just trying to kill each other. Uh, but you know but I can get into some of it I mean there's been some good remakes like the Evil Dead remake I thought was pretty decent um, took a little different spin on it and stuff like that but um, but yeah it just I, it's just kind of sometimes bothers me when it's like someone would be like oh do you want to watch Black Christmas and you're like well which one the 74 2006 or the like 2019 <laughs> yeah. you know so you're like it's just I don't know so it it just, is, yeah like, now we're getting to a point where like reboots or remakes are getting remade again, you know, yes. but you know, like sometimes like you get the first remake, right. That is set, you know, and it's, it's almost supposed to be similar to the original, but it's its own thing. They kind of change a few things. And then you have the remake after the remake where it's a remake of the first remake, but it's set after the events of night of the 1974 black Christmas, you know, like it's like yeah. set 10 years after like I, I don't, I don't know exactly why they do these. I mean, because there, there are certain cases where this kind of thing could work. For example, like a lot of people did not appreciate the Ghostbusters reboot. You know, the Afterlife one, right? Yeah, so. no, 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 no. The 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 one by Paul uh, Paul Feig, I think. Oh, with the girls that everyone yeah, was answer like, the call. Oh, you girls. Yeah, which which me personally, like I, I it's not about the girls, but you know, me, per- I, I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. For I have not seen it, but I have, I have, I, I think it seemed fine. I mean, I'm not like a, maybe I would feel differently if I was a huge Ghostbuster fan. I really do like uh, Ghostbusters. Okay, okay. I like them a lot, but I have some other friends who are like diehard Ghostbuster fans who are like, they know all the backstory of it, you know, everything. And yeah. so I could see how maybe, you know, but even I, even from, I didn't see Afterlife, but even that one I heard was a lot of like fan service types of just like, oh, hey, do you remember the Marshmallow Man? Yeah. Hey, you know, they just kept bringing back stuff from back then that was like, I might as well just go back and watch Ghostbusters. Like the yeah, original. I, and uh, I'm not a diehard Ghostbusters fan. I, I love the franchise for what for what it's given us. Um, I love Answer the Call. I love Afterlife. Um, but I, I see exactly why a lot of people were upset about Answer the Call and they, they embrace Afterlife and 
Like th- there's just like, Angela Cole of... is the Paul Feig with the women. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. And the then Saturday Afterlife Night, the was Saturday one. Night Live cast was, was, yeah. was primarily in that. Um, but uh, a lot of people make it about certain things that uh, really doesn't need to make like on the table about like you know why it is the movie that it is. You know. Now why did it... Why, uh, what did, I mean, I, like I said, I didn't see Afterlife, but what about it did you really like? Was it just like, it was a continuation of the story, I guess, then? Yeah, like, it, yeah. it's set, it's set a few decades after the original team, like, decided to retire, and, yeah. you know, then, you know, members of the uh, original team, family members, you know, discover, you know, the, the entire, like, history of what the Ghostbusters did, and they okay. form, they discovered, you know, the original car, and, you know, they basically, you know reinvent the ghostbusters for the current generation you know for you know the the kids that were once members of the family uh once family members of the original team okay. and you know you see you, you see uh gozer again you see like like a lot of the elements that were in the original are now returning in the current day they're like I, I'm, try, I'm trying to like uh kind of not get into explicit detail about this so i don't want yeah, you know, yeah, to put spoilers out there but like you know um it's just it's it's more relatable to the original as opposed to what the secondary one did. In, in a way, this, uh, the answer the call version is a Ghostbusters film, but it's in its own universe where yeah. the original team like isn't really there. Okay, it's just like a different spin on it, kind of thing. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a different spin. Yeah, so like with Afterlife, the, the thing that I would have, like, I mean, that sounds great, but like. I do remember, like, the trailer and things that I've seen or whatever. Because, um, like, you know, you got you got the original Marshmallow Man in the first one or when it's first one, right? But then when they bring him back in the afterlife, he's, like, this little cute CGI little squishy thing. And so that's, like, that's what I would be afraid of with Tales from the Crypt. Like, they would take, say they take the creature from the ventriloquist dummy, which was this amazing puppet, and they turn it into this little CGI <laughs> type thing. Hang on one second, Gus is at the door. No problem, no problem. For those who uh, who listen, this is Gus the podcast. Hey! This is the one that you sometimes hear running around like a spaz in the background. Oh my god! And uh, knocking things over, huh? Yeah. Oh, he's a big one. Yeah, he's like sixteen pounds. Oh yeah, like I wish uh, Zuko, my my cat Zuko. He's a he's a domestic short hair black cat, and he was. Oh yeah, I saw him walking around. Yeah, he was sniffing around here. He's he's a, <laughs> he's some most of the time whenever I'm doing my work for uh, producing the the upscales and whatnot, or just doing stuff like this, like he'll jump on the table right in front of me and lay on top of my keyboard. Like, he, he's all over the place. He always wants the cables, like cables and, and headphones and stuff. Mm-hmm. Trying to chew on them. But the, oh, yeah. yeah. So the door was shut, so God forbid he couldn't get it in here. So now he's here. Yeah, my cat uh, always shoulder tackles the door whenever we close <laughs> the bedroom door. He's just like that. So, okay. Uh... Reboots, the Tales reboot. Yeah, I can I, I can completely understand exactly where you're coming from. Uh, I like some of the creatures design or some of the like the blood splatter could be digital. It like practical effects is a key thing when it comes to a Tales episode. Uh, the, the idea like, like the idea of the Crypt Keeper possibly being a CGI pu- uh, CGI and instead of actual animatronic puppet. Oh yeah, no. sorry. I thought I saw a tail. Yeah, yeah, there, there he is. In the moment Aww. of discussion. What's up, buddy? And what's his name? Zuko. Zuko. Aww. You, you say hi? <laughs> he's you say like, hi? I just wanted to sneak around. I didn't want to be no. on screen. You know, he's, he's very camera shy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I can definitely uh, 100% agree with uh, your viewpoint on that. Because, like, a lot of people don't enjoy the idea of seeing their, their childhood kind of, like, skewered you know and well and if you're gonna bring it back then do it right yeah yeah then that's what we talked about that if they could do it then why not do it you know they did in the 90s why not do it now no i would imagine some of the tale the the stories would maybe have to change a little bit there are some some tropes and things that are in the original series that i don't feel would quite fly in 2021 22 
Uh, like, yeah. Um, see, and then that's that's one that's one aspect that I've discussed with many fans. Uh, I think we discussed it at one point on the podcast where uh, the idea of bringing content like Tales, because if you if you really think about it, when the original comics came out, the uh, the public reception of those comics was obviously bad, and yes. you know you had um, uh, you had psychologists, you know, um, and you know fan, uh, parents who burned these comic books and, you know, uh, really, really went out of the way to make it seem like these comic books were the most evil thing that a young child could read and would be the reason why we had, you know, violence, you know, in, in, in the youth. And when you have content like that, that's so offensive in, in those, uh, those, time, those time periods, you have that kind of public moral outrage from them. We had it with the comic books. We had it with video games. We had it with movies. Uh, if you brought Tales back nowadays to 2022, you know, would it survive the public and moral outrage that we that we are known now to have in the last 10 years when it comes to what gets put out? You know, like, would it survive? Would it get canceled within three episodes? <laughs> Uh, you know, for either like in, like lack of inclusion, uh, certain content being way too graphic or offensive, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, in my personal opinion, based on how the success of EC Comics has been uh, for the decades that it was publicized, it was it was publicated, uh, and then plus the TV show becoming a success for what it was. And then also, you know, the Creek Keeper itself, the Creek Keeper character becoming a national icon in 90s pop culture. Uh, I would think that if you went offensive, if you went graphic, then you're doing your job. Like, 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 like that, that would be the whole purpose of, you know, the whole Tales franchise. It's meant to push your buttons. It's meant to... Yeah, it's supposed to make, shock it's supposed to shock and scare you to the point where you're questioning things or to the point where you are talking about it. Like if you're talking about it, like <laughs> the show is doing its job. The franchise is doing its job. So. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you feel the same way, but. I mean, yeah. I mean, I just feel like to an ex to a certain extent, there's going to be some stuff they would have to avoid. Um, like I feel like, like, um, I don't know if you're, do you know, um, the assassin, the episode, the assassin yeah. from Tales of Crimson. I feel like that one would maybe be a problem where the guy went under a sex change to be a woman. Uh, yeah. I feel like that one could have been a problem. I think even the one, well, I don't know. I mean, it's a little bit about psycho, but even the one where the guy is pretending to be his mother, um, comes, uh, came to uh, dawn, come, comes come, to dawn. Comes to dawn. No, it's came to dawn. They need oh, to stop. So, yeah, a lot of these episodes have similar, <laughs> there's like similar names. Uh, I think it's Cave the Dawn. But yeah, that one. And then there's just like, you know, a couple like derogatory terms towards like LGBT type things that yeah. would probably have to change too. But, um, yeah. but for the most part, I mean, I think it could probably keep with what it's doing and be fine. It's a lot of the similar type episodes where it's either like, you know, well, one is like voodoo is bad. That's usually one of the tropes. And then you got like someone's cheating on someone. It's usually no one's ever in a happy relationship half the time. And I mean, like right. seriously, I think I can only remember maybe two episodes where they were um, money. It's usually money, or um, uh, then there's like the fun like body horror type weird ones, you know, that, like right. um, control of a dummy and things like that. Like I think some of the, if they did some of the creature ones and stuff, that would be pretty fun. Uh, but if they're gonna make them look good, you know, kind of. Yeah, yeah, which, you know, like I said, it's all about CGI, and, you know, you said it's CGI as well, and then practical effects is taken out of the, out of the, the budget there, you know, they, they think it's cheaper to go CGI as opposed to practical effects, which I don't, I don't truly understand, maybe it's because I'm not in Hollywood production, you know, to know what, what the uh, difference in terms of budget is, but, you know, I don't, well, I think really even if you, if you, if you blend it well, I think it could be good, because I know, like, I mean, I've seen a lot of horror movies, and there's some people out there who are still doing practical effects, which is great. But then there's some people who've been kind of blended a little bit, where it's like you can't really tell the difference. But then sometimes it's not based on what it is. Like, um, have you ever seen 2015's Krampus? I have not seen Krampus. 
Okay, so just to like, I don't know, it's, it's a really great movie. It's really fun. Uh, it sets the, the scene of being real bleak and cold, and it's, it's fun. Um, there's this great kind of puppet of this jack-in-the-box that can swallow kids, and it's terrifying. But then, and that's done more like practical effects, but then there's these little gingerbread dudes that kill people that are not, there's more CGI and it, it's, it pulls you out. Like it looks, they look really cartoonish. And I can see like, I mean, they were still kind of cute and it was fun because they have like little like peppermint sticks that are like little swords, you know, and stuff like that. But like right. after seeing the, the Jack in the Box, you're just like, wow, that's so crazy, you know, and then so. Um, just things like that, but yeah, I definitely am more for practical effects. That's why I really like um, like '80s horror and things like that. There's always a lot of that kind of stuff, and even just like giving jobs to people who do practical effects, it's hard work. Like, yeah, uh, like speaking of like the thing, uh, the guy who did the the '82 version of the thing, it just about killed him doing all the effects for that. So, so yeah, to, just you know, it, I think it would take a lot to bring it back, but I wouldn't be completely against, like, if they wanted to try bringing a season back of Tales from the Crypt, like, get that eighth season, like you said, you know, and just see what happens, but uh, I just think it should have multiple directors and and things, you know. Yeah, because I remember uh, TNT was talking about, like, one season of the revival would be one single story put out in multiple episodes, which, mm. you know, that right there was a turn off for me the moment I read it. Yeah. Was, like, like that's not that's not what tales is. I mean, at least like like how would you be able to actually flesh out multiple EC comic storylines, you know, in one season where it's episodic, you know? Yeah, that sounds more like they'd be trying to be more like American Horror Story than like Creep Show. You know? Yeah. So. Which which that that to me that that's not what tales is, but <laughs> you know. Um, for what we know is it's it's not happening yet, you know, uh, as far as we know at all. So I, I don't think we need to discuss that any further than until we get more information. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Okay, but, but but let's cut down to the nitty gritty of the tale of revival. Um, now you already you already know we we discussed this the the rights issue has been a colossal mess. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been we've been discussing uh, for years uh, what. Uh, we want as fans, you know, from this franchise, and mostly the the highest form of demand that we've been asking for was the uh, Blu-ray box set uh, for Tales, uh, the series. But we have we still have not gotten it. Um, hopefully, we do get it sooner than later, especially since uh, you know right now the the rights from Tales from Crypt Holdings has been uh, phased out. So hopefully, we do some do see something sooner than later. Um, but what I want to know is from you. Uh, if a Tales revival happens, what? Give me a grocery list. What do you want to see from that revival? I think it would be neat to, if they kept with the the whole thing of like, yeah, they used celebrities, but a lot of the celebrities they used were kind of in the beginning of their careers. Some of them, so it'd be nice to kind of use it as a platform to push new people in the horror genre, or even not in the horror genre, because I think some of the ones that are more comical, having, you know, like, having Bobcat both both weight and things like that, and Don Rickles and all that, it, you know, made it kind of fun. But I definitely want to see, like, more, you know, creatures, different creatures, different weird twists, um, you know, a little more of, like, a mystery. It doesn't have to be too intense, but just, like, enough to where it would maybe sometimes throw me off. For people who have seen a lot of horror and horror shows, sometimes it's easy to predict certain things. Right. And so by the end, you're like, yeah, I figured that was going to be it. But uh, to have a couple every once in a while, like not, you know, kind of actually shock you would be cool. But and then definitely different directors for each episode. Not necessarily like the producers or even, you know, stuff like that, but just to have someone give it different visions on how they do, you know, different things um, and play into their strengths and whatnot, you know, um, female directors, things like that, you know, all that. So that's kind of where I'd like to see it. And if, hopefully, they, you know, maybe they will do the Blu-ray. They can bring it out for Halloween this year since they got the, the right side. That'd be pretty cool. I mean, we're all waiting on that one. That announcement, yeah. So hopefully. But, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of what you said, you know, you know, is on the on the chopping block for me in terms of, like, you know, what uh, I would want on the list as well, you know. But, you know, I've already, I've already made a video on what I would want. 
of what other fans <laughs> would want. So I don't think we need to cover uh, my perspective on that one. Uh, so that's, I don't know. Like, that's what's, a, that's a what, would, what would be, what's one of the main things that you definitely would want to see? One of the main things? Oof. Uh, like deal breaker if they don't put it in there. Or don't. Yeah. Oof. Oh my god. Um, if, season, uh, if season eight were to happen, or just Tales Revival, um, if they bring back the Free Keeper, it needs to be a puppet. It, it needs yes. to be a puppet. I agree. Uh, like, the the puppet itself, I mean, like, it doesn't even have to look like the HBO Crypt Keeper. If they're going to go puppet and they're going to make it look more EC Comics themed and, and relatable to the EC Comics uh, depiction of the Crypt Keeper, you know, it has to be a puppet. Because the puppet gives, and forgive my pun, it gives life to, to the character. You know, um, just imagining a person, you know, in, in robes. Because, like, we, we've seen that before with the Amicus films. Um, mm-hmm. I don't I don't really think they knew exactly how to hit hit that properly when it came to making it. Uh, I, I guess I guess he was the Grim Reaper of that of that of that film um, because, you know, he didn't hit the puns. He, he didn't hit uh, that uh, that presence that the Crypt people would have. Yeah, and, he was more of a guy. He yeah, yeah, like, he was, he was just more like a guy, you know. Uh, and but when it comes down to the revival, if the Creek Keeper is a part of it, then I I need to see a puppet of some sort, uh, whether it be the HBO Creep Keeper uh, brought back or it has to be, you know, more uh, closer to the EC um, depiction of what the Creep or what the, what the Creep Keeper is. Uh, and if they do well, bring back about- the HBO, hmm? no, go ahead, go ahead. No, and I was going to say that if they do decide to bring back the HBO Crypt Keeper, uh, you know, it has, well, like, we have Kassir. that. Chem- well, yes, because here obviously is going to voice the Crypt Keeper. I mean, it ha- that's mm-hmm. mandatory. But I, I need it to be Kevin Yeager's puppet. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like the, the, the puppet that we got since Kids WB with the sci fi promos, Secrets of the Crypt Keeper's Haunted House, that's not Yeager's puppet that yeah. they used. So if they ever bring it back, it has to be Kevin Yeager's puppet. Is that also similar to that other puppet? Like, because I prefer the one, like, Jaeger's puppet, where it's, you know, the eyes move, you got the, 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 it, the skin moves. It's a little more, like, descriptive and um, expressive. But then when I watch Ritual, they have this intro, and it's basically just this creepy-looking creeper sitting there, barely moving, and it's just him doing a Jamaican accent. And it just seems like it's more of a prop than anything. So I'm like, yeah. I, I was like, they just set that one up on the side and moved its mouth a little bit, <laughs> and they were like, "Here we go." Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly because like there, there is not much uh, like set photos of what the new Crypt Keeper puppet or the yeah. recent one looks like on uh, like in its animatronic skull or like under uh, like the latex mask that it wears. Um, everything that Kevin Yeager has put out or what we have seen. Uh, behind the scenes, there is there is animatronics. There are gears that you know, work almost every like the the cheekbones, the the eyelids, the it, like even the nose itself flares out sometimes. The lips can puff out in and out based on pronunciation of words. You know there was a lot of um, detail that was put into the animatronic skull itself just to be able to show the crib keeper's expression when it comes to a lot of especially when you see. A lot of the close-ups in his segments, mm-hmm. you know, in this in the show, like sometimes you're just like, oh my god, that looks way. Yeah, too I'm good. always, like, I'm always commenting on, especially like the way he has like this little cheekbone that kind of shows through on the side, mm-hmm. and I always think it's pretty neat. Yeah, and like uh, when you watch the the Crypt Keeper since uh, Secrets of the Crypt Keeper's Haunted House, and you know, since all the way to Fear Net's New Year Shock and Eve special, like it's it's not the same. Mm-hmm. So like you know. Uh, and if I recall, I believe I read something where the new Crypt Keeper puppet is just completely computer based. The only, the, the only thing that the only thing that is being um, fluid in terms of movement is there is a puppeteer behind the Crypt Keeper's chair working his arms. Like there's gloves, uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic. But gloves. not the face. No, no, the face is completely computerized. Mm-hmm. Like you know, like it, it's there's a program. That they have plugs going into into the Crypt Keeper's head, and that hmm. is what controls the animatronic facial detail. But the puppeteer himself, he's behind the Crypt Keeper um, with like a, a skeleton glove that looks like the Crypt Keeper's hands, and you know, 
you see him doing all these hand movements and whatnot to make the crypt keeper look a little bit more lifelike. But aside from that, like that that's about it. And and sometimes when you see the new crypt keeper, I mean actually scratch that, any crypt keeper puppet you see doesn't actually have arms. <laughs> but when, when when but when Cameron Yeager makes a static crypt keeper uh puppet, it does have arms, it does have legs, it does have a torso. But most of the time when you see the crypt keeper animate himself <laughs> pun intended um uh you see that there is actually somebody controlling his arms by puppeteering when they have like a synthetic arm can you see it from the front or is it more just like if you are behind the puppet you can see it like can you tell that there's a guy well if you if you look at some of the uh i don't know if you have the official archives by digby deal um <laughs> they actually show uh diagrams of how they made the crypt keeper work there they show the puppeteers you know, they they show a diagram of the puppeteer behind him. Here's the crypt keeper working the arms, and then there's another puppeteer underneath him uh, for any other other additional movement. So <laughs> that's how that's how that works. Okay. So yeah, I mean, like if you ever uh, have time to look at the, uh, I mean, there, I think there's a PDF file digitally of it, or if you look up, like if you just Google image searches, sometimes you can find it. Uh, if you ever find uh, time, like you can actually look it up and see it. Uh, actually, I think I have the archives right here. Uh, let's see if I can find it really quick. <laughs> I'm getting close. <laughs> the episode guide. Ah, here we go. Okay, yeah, I just found that picture. Yeah. Okay, I see. Huh. I mean, I guess that's one way to do it. I mean, does it look okay from the front? I mean, absolutely. I mean, when you watch the episodes, I mean, can you tell? Okay, so this is what they did in the episodes from the, the 90s. Yeah, same exact concept, right? And not only that, but you also see some screenshots of Crypt Keeper's animatronic skull and okay. one of the puppeteers actually behind the Crypt Keeper. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Because, yeah, I always thought, didn't it take, like, it takes, like, up to, I thought sometimes it took, like, four people or something to work. Seven. Seven, that's right. Mm-hmm. I knew it was, like, a couple. <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the puppeteers, uh, Brock Linkless, uh, who sadly passed away, rest in peace to his soul, you know, he was one of the... Uh, crucial elements of making Chucky work and, ma- and making uh, the Crypt Keeper work because he was the uh, the one who would give the Crypt Keeper expression and when he would, because they he used to wear this, uh, this apparatus that would go around his head and on the sides of his jaw. So whenever he moved his jaw and enunciated anything, the, the mouth movement would come out from each That's of those awesome. characters. Yeah, so he, he, was a, he was a big crucial part as to making... Uh, Chucky work and in terms of making Crypt Keeper work. And then to be able to line that up with how John Kassir would speak it. Yeah. You know, kind I, of thing, yeah. I don't, I don't even recall if it was, I mean, I would assume that John Kassir had to read his lines first and he had to play yeah. back, you know, in order to match the words up. Because there, there's one case and one situation where you would have um, uh, live, live events, right? Or where, like, for example, the... Um, the Horror Hall of Fame special mm-hmm. where the Creek Keeper kind of guest hosted on that. And I don't know if John Cassier was actually there doing voiceover work while he was there or if they already pre-recorded that kind of stuff. Because like, I can only imagine being in a live setting like that where you have you know, a whole bunch of people watching and all of a sudden yeah. there's a mess up. But uh, <laughs> more, mostly I know it was pre-recorded. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. All right, so... What is next on the chopping block for Melissa? What what do you have going on and what do you plan on doing uh, after the, the podcast? I mean, you already mentioned earlier about uh, possibly collaborating with others and, and taking a vacation from podcasting because due to editing reasons. Um, but, you know, uh, is there anything else that, you know, uh, you got going on for yourself in the future? Uh I mean, just basically that, that, you know, just more like horror movie stuff. If, I mean, if I do collaborate with someone, I like I said, I, I, the editing, I'd rather they edit. 
<laughs> you know, I'm like, I'll do all the research. That's fine. Just, I just need a break from the editing. But I'd also like to, once all this, you know, if we can get something um, with this, like, pandemic getting past, like, I'd like to get back into musical theater or theater in general. Okay. Uh, one thing that kind of, like, like, after, like, 15 years, I used to do it in high school, and then after, like, 15 years or so, I got into, I was in the production of Chicago in 2019. Oh, very nice. And it, yeah, it was really fun. And then that kind of started slowing down some of my episodes. But um, but then, like, sh- you know, the next year, we were supposed to do Mamma Mia, and then everything hit, and just, everything's just been, like, shut down. So I've done some voiceover stuff, and I've done, like, you know, some script readings and stuff online, but that's pretty much it. You know, so hopefully, you know, once all this is done and I have a little more time and stuff, I'd like to get back in the field. So. Gotcha, gotcha. And I, I think that's going to be a great venture for you, especially, I mean, I, I just hope, you know, for everybody's sake, including your own, that, you know, this pandemic dies down officially and, you know, it opens up the floodgates for us to be able to enjoy ourselves fully the way we used to, especially when, you know, it it limits our capacity for being able to not only enjoy ourselves, but to just express who we are as people. You know, it's caused a a big handicap in that aspect. Yeah, because in theater, you're like in the back, especially a big production like Chicago, like I was thinking about it later, I was like, man, you're just breathing all over each other back there. Like, so there's like 40 people. Everyone's changing costumes and stuff. So yeah, it's just, it's really hard to have a big production. Yeah. Safely. Right, I can only imagine. I mean, because you can do so much to try to prevent and mitigate the spread of COVID. I mean, you can get vaccinated, you know, you can keep a mask up, but, you know, it's still susceptible to many people just like that, yeah. you know. Especially if, you know, like there, there's those who don't want to get vaccinated and that, and that adds a whole level of complication to the whole production. I, I, I could easily assume. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, aside from that, you know, uh, not to end it on a down note, but, you know, good luck to you in, in those ventures in the future. And I know for a fact you're going to slay and kill it. So, you thank know, you. good luck to you in those. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap things up now. Uh, I just want to thank you scary much for uh, being a part of the episode. You've been a great, great guest. Um, Do me a favor and look at the camera and tell everybody out there what you got going on and what's uh, coming up in the future. Well, again, Jonathan, thank you so much for having me on. This has been awesome to talk to you. And yeah, you can check out the Good Evening Kitties podcast pretty much any po- anywhere you get your podcast. There's also a Facebook page and I'm mostly active on Twitter which is at Deck Podcast or at G-E-K Podcast. Uh, there's also an Instagram page for the cat, Gus the Podcat. It's at a sweet cat named Gus if you want to do that. But yeah, you can find the Tales from the Crypt reviews and horror movie reviews uh, at the Good Evening Kitties Podcast on Podbean. So that's usually where I'm mostly located or like my main page. Awesome, awesome. And by the way, guys, make sure you check the description box right here in this video. That way you can check out all the links. They will be provided. So in case you guys want to get a quick link, subscribe, follow her. You know, it's all going to be in the description box. And oh, also, oh, what you got? Well, I was just going to say, also check out Jonathan on my Demon Night review episode. You should put a link to that in there, too. Because no, no, hey, hey, listen, listen. I'm trying to plug you in, okay? <laughs> I'm trying episode. to reciprocate. <laughs> All right, so, oh, and don't forget, guys, tonight at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, we got Dead Weight premiering in Gore K format, all right? So don't miss it, all right? All right, oh, oh and also, uh, we also broadcasted uh, another episode of Reanimated Tales from the Crypt Keeper, so make sure you check that out. In the future, there will be a, a, a new Saturday morning Reanimated Tales from the Crypt Keeper. That way, you guys can have your bowl of cereal and get the pants scared off of you every morning, okay? Get your PJ scared off. So that being said, I want to thank you guys for all joining us again. One more time, Melissa, thank you for being a part of the episode. Thank I you. really, really am grateful that you were able and humbled that you were able to join us. Thank you so much. Yeah. And with that said, I want to give you guys all uh, a thank you. Thank you for joining us and have a good fright. Just had quite a scare. I actually thought my heart was beating again.